Hello, good evening, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for tonight's PHN COVID-19 vaccine update for allied health professionals. Tonight's webinar is being both facilitated and presented by Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. My name is Charles Broadfoot and I am the Hunter Professional Development Officer with the PHN. And I'd firstly like to acknowledge the First Peoples and traditional custodians of the lands in which we're all meeting tonight and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So tonight's session is being recorded and the recording and the slides will become available on our website from tomorrow. So just head to our website, which is thephn.com.au and click on the education tab. So after the main presentation, we will have time for questions. So to ask questions of the presenters, uh, just type them into the chat box in your control panel, type them throughout the session and we'll get to these after the presentation. When the webinar ends, uh, an evaluation survey will automatically pop up. If you could just take a moment to fill that out before you log off, uh, we really appreciate your feedback. So now I'd like to introduce tonight's presenter, John Bailey. John is an Executive Manager for Primary Care Improvement here at the PHN. And also joining us on the panel is Dr. Trent Watson. Trent is a dietitian and the CEO of Ethos Health and also a board member here at the PHN. So thanks everyone for joining us and I'll hand over to you, John. Thanks, Charles, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us, Trent. I appreciate your presence here tonight. Uh, what I'd like to do is provide you with a bit of an update on what we know in relation to the vaccine rollout for uh, COVID uh, and particularly focus on the uh, aspects of that that are relevant to uh, allied health practitioners, professionals. Thanks, uh, uh, Charles, if you can go to the next slide. So just a little bit of an update on where we're at with the uh, vaccine and approvals. Uh, so far, we've had two vaccines approved for use in Australia. Both have been provisionally approved. Um, the Pfizer vaccine uh, has been, was approved in late February and uh, that vaccine is being used for phase 1A of the rollout. Um, I have to note for you that the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine is produced overseas uh, in Belgium and is flown into Australia. So we are reliant on the overseas supply chain for the Pfizer vaccine and some of the vagaries of uh, trying to transport a very fragile and, and sensitive product around the globe and then within Australia. So the Pfizer vaccine needs to be stored at minus 70 degrees and is a particularly challenging product to transport and administer. The uh, other vaccine that is currently approved for use in Australia is what's known as the Oxford or, or AstraZeneca vaccine. This vaccine was uh, approved on, on the 16th uh, and we have commenced uh, the uh, selection of general practices to deliver that vaccine with practices being informed in the last 24 hours whether they were deemed eligible for the administration of that fix vaccine once it rolls off the production line. Australia's in a really lucky position in that we have uh, sovereign production of the AstraZeneca vaccine. That means it's produced onshore here in Australia in the CSL facility in Melbourne. Um, that gives us a lot more control and we're less susceptible to the vagaries of uh, international vaccine distribution or transportation. The other advantage of the AstraZeneca vaccine is that it can be handled and transported in a way that we're familiar with uh, that involves uh, storage uh, at normal vaccine uh, temperatures. The Pfizer vaccine will be used for the 1A group of patients and those uh, patients are in the um, aged care facility, quarantine and other high risk vulnerable groups. Uh, and that uh, vaccination commenced this week. Uh, we have to acknowledge that it hasn't gone smoothly this week, but what I'd like to say is pe for people just to keep in mind that the rollout of these vaccines is the biggest logistics exercise ever undertaken in Australia and probably globally for that matter. Um, we're 
we are trying to deliver uh, around about 50 million doses of vaccine uh, over the next uh, year or whatever it takes us to do that. And there will be some teething problems and we, and we need to acknowledge that this is not an easy exercise. Later in the year, we expect that some of the other vaccines that are uh, in the final phases of clinical trials, such as Moderna, Novax and Covax, uh, will come on uh, later. Um, it's also worth noting that the uh, Russians are producing a vaccine uh, called Sputnik, uh, and their vaccine is uh, being uh, actively used in their country and being assessed uh, in other parts of the world as well. So we're, we're going to have a, a quite an armory of vaccines for COVID-19. Thanks, Charles. So what do we know so far and uh, how will health professionals working in the primary care area be able to access vaccine for themselves and their teams? Okay, depending on uh, where you work uh, and your age and other parameters will dictate where you're, uh, when you are able to access the vaccine. If you're an allied health provider working within the local health district, uh, then you will be uh, vaccinated as part of the uh, 1A or 1B uh, rollout, depending on which part of the service you work in. And local health districts, Central Coast in our case and Hunter New England, uh, will be responsible for vaccinating their staff. For uh, people who work in aged care facilities, they will be able to access the AstraZeneca vaccine as soon as that uh, rolls off and the uh, vaccine will be provided to allied health providers who work in aged care facilities uh, very shortly. Other uh, healthcare workers, including uh, GPs who don't work in respiratory clinics, dentists, et cetera, will be uh, provided the vaccine as part of 1B. And if they um, and other low risk uh, workers will be uh, part of 2A, which is a more generalized rollout. If you wanna graphically see that rollout, then there's a hyperlink there to the Australia's vaccine rollout strategy. Next slide, thanks. Uh, actually, there we go. So this is what the rollout looks like. And these are the two phases uh, where Allied Health will be able to access the vaccination for themselves and their teams. I think it's worth noting that, uh, you know, in, in those two phases, 1B and 2A, respectively 14.8 million doses and 15.8 million doses for distribution. Uh, and then subsequent to that would be 2A, uh, sorry, 2B, which is the catch up and more general population with around about 16 million doses. Just to put that in context for you, we on average in a normal year, uh, provide about 7 million influenza vaccines uh, nationally. So what we're talking about is a very significant ramp up of the volume of vaccines that need to be delivered to our communities over the next uh, period. Thanks, Charles. So if you work in a residential aged care facility, the residential aged care facility, and you visit that regularly, the facility will contact you and ask whether you want to receive the AstraZeneca vaccine along with their staff members. And if you do, they'll advise you of the date at which the in-reach provider, in the case of New South Wales, that's Healthcare Australia, uh, the date at which they will be attending the site and uh, they will provide you with advice on when you can have your vaccine and what you need to do to consent to do that. Healthcare Australia have been contracted to do all of New South Wales and a couple of the other states. Uh, they have a, started that this week uh, in, on the Central Coast and then we'll gradually work through our region as vaccine becomes available and as their workforce becomes available. Thanks, Charles.
allied health professionals as advocates. I just wanted to canvas with you that uh, allied health providers play a big part or can play a big part in uh, advocacy and ensuring that our uh, community get the right message and a clear message and that uh, some of the misinformation and disinformation around is clarified. So it would be useful for you to be able to explain to you, your patients uh, that the vaccines that we're using in Australia have been through the Australian Therapeutics Good Administration regulatory process uh, and that they are safe and effective. We know that um, the vaccines have been used for a period prior to being approved in, in Australia in jurisdictions such as the UK and in Europe. So we've also got the evidence and the data from those jurisdictions which started a, a couple of months earlier than us. Australia's in a really lucky position that we have uh, no locally acquired uh, COVID at the moment. So we can take, take our time and get this right. And, and that included the delay or the perceived delay in approving these, giving us, a, if you like, a buffer to see what has occurred overseas. For many people, the vaccine, uh, who have a course of the vaccine, uh, they will um, have milder symptoms uh, of the illness, if, if at all, uh, and that's the value. The perception that the vaccine prevents you from getting the illness is not yet supported by the data, but what is supported by the data is if you do get the illness, it's much milder than what you would experience if you didn't. And for the Australian healthcare system, that means that we are less likely to face the calamity of a health system that is stretched to breaking point with no intensive care beds and, and severely overworked uh, uh, providers as, such as we're seeing in the US and the UK. I think it's really important for us as health professionals to uh, reinforce that message with our community that Australian, the Australian population and our government and, uh, and our scientists and our, our doctors have done the hard yards to protect us. Uh, we've listened to the science all the way through this pandemic to date and it has held us in good stead and I see no reason and I don't think anyone reasonably could see any reason to change that now. Uh, the science has supported us and we should continue to listen to the science and, and not the disinformation or, or outright, outright, outright misinformation. Just wanted to also touch that uh, the research hasn't stopped. It is continuing on the vaccines and their efficacy and reducing the transmission of COVID-19. There are trials in the UK of mixing products. So using uh, a Pfizer vaccine for dose A and a AstraZeneca for dose B to see whether or not they impact. And later on in, uh, in this process, we will we'll have another uh, webinar series with Dr. David Durheim to give us a bit of an update on what's occurred in the, sci in the scientific uh, results of that in other jurisdictions. So watch out on our website for that, uh, that webinar. The other important thing I think that allied health professionals can do is direct their patients back to their GP if they've got clinical questions or questions about their specific health uh, conditions. And later in the slides, I'll, I'll provide you with some links to reliable and reputable uh, sources of information for you, for you, your staff and your patients. Thanks, Trent. Uh, thanks, Charles, sorry. Okay. Just to give you a bit of an update, uh, here are some of the links for the PHN support. Um, you can subscribe to our uh, COVID-19 email updates. We can, you can view this and previous uh, recordings and presentations, and you can watch the calendar for events that we'll be holding over the next few months. Uh, we're doing a whole series of them, and we would encourage you to Take, take the time to dial in for, for those and, and hear what's being 
uh, provided the latest information. Just uh, as Ch just to reinforce, as Charles said, we'll provide a copy of these slides uh, after the uh, webinar tonight, so you don't have to write them down. We'll we'll get those out to you. I've also provided to Charles for distribution a copy of the product information sheet for both the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, there are two information sheets for each vaccine. One is the technical one that uh, health professionals usually see, and the other one is the consumer advice information sheet. And, and that's very similar to what you see in other medic medicines. So really good uh, piece of um, a sheet of information for you and your patients and uh, something that's freely available. We'll provide a copy to you, but if you want to direct your patients to the TGA website, uh, there are, there's, there's a copy of, a, of them on that website. Thanks, Charles. Just also wanted to remind you of the very valuable resource in Health Pathways and the Health Pathways websites. We have uh, two Health Pathways communities. The first one is the Central Coast Health Pathways, and you can see the hyperlink to that uh, particular pathway there, or set of pathways there, uh, the username and the password, and we have a comparable set of Health Pathways for Hunter New England, and you can see the password and username there. The reason that there are two Health Pathway websites is that our Health Pathways are localised for each location for each local health district because the services and the uh, uh, opportunities uh, are different in each of those locations. So we very much try to provide local information uh, if we can, and that's what Pathways uh, does. Thanks, Charles. Again, for your patients, we have a, uh, a, a couple of websites called Patient Info, and you've got the hyperlink there to the Central Coast Patient Info website, and the hyperlink there to the Hunter New England Patient Info site. Those websites contain a significant body of information about a range of conditions, uh, including COVID. So again, if you you know if you have a patient who uh, is asking you some questions and you you're not quite sure, or you or you want to um, provide them with a reliable source, we'd encourage you to use patient info uh, rather than googling uh, some random site. Thanks, Charles. The last uh, sort of set of resources that we'd like to remind you about are the Australian Government Department of Health websites. Um, you can uh, go to the first one, which is the up-to-date uh, information provided with by the Commonwealth Department of, of Health, and, uh, and particularly related to the COVID-19 vaccines. And you can also subscribe to the updates and have them fed through to your email inbox. Uh, automatically through an RSS feed, if you'd like. Thanks, Charles. Ready for questions, Trent? Oh, yeah. Good to go. Thanks. Yeah, I'll come back in. Um, we've got a few questions coming through, John. Um, so one is, where do private? I'm going to. I'll broaden this out. It says, why, where do private practicing uh, physios fit into the rollout? One A, or one B, or two A? But we might. Can I just get you to comment on that more generally, John? For you know, all allied health practitioners across the board. Sure. Um, look, uh, physios are not uh, um, treated any differently to any other allied health group. So, um, please excuse the phrase. They're all grouped together. Uh, for, for the purposes of the vaccine. Uh, there are two possible phases in which, or, or actually three possible phases in which you would be able to access the vaccine. If you're a private practitioner who does some work in the uh, disability group home sector or the aged care sector, you will be eligible under 1A. Uh, and the uh, aged care facility provider will contact you to um, let you know when, and if they don't, contact 
the, the facility you visit and they'll be able to tell you when uh, HCA are coming to do the vaccine at that particular site. For disability, and I noticed there's a question around NDIS clients, who, um, the, the NDIS uh, group home or supported living sector is being worked through at the moment. Uh, the Commonwealth are leading that and are working with the uh, disability sector peaks to uh, work, work up a methodology where we can um, get vaccine to people who live in NDIS uh, supported accommodation or, or are supported by NDIS. For providers who support NDIS clients, then we would again encourage you to contact the facility or the group home if it's a group home and make sure that they keep you on the list of uh, 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 itinerant or transient staff uh, so that you then get notified when that site is being done. If you treat uh, disability patients in your private practice, uh, then we, depending on the age of the the uh, people, you would be either eligible under 1B or 2A. So again, it's dependent on the cohort. And then there's also your own individual uh, circumstances. So, you know, if, if you're a uh, health practitioner who's over the age of 80 and still practicing, you would be eligible in 1B. Uh, but if you're um, not, then you'd either be eligible in uh, in one B, clinical high risk workers, or alternatively in two A. So, John, um, what about the admin staff as well? Are they grouped into the same bucket? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Um, this is about protecting um, uh, people. So, you know, where admin staff are um, part of a, a practice, and they're they're. Uh, not treating patients, but they're seeing patients there, you know, across the counter, uh, if you like. Uh, they're as at risk as anyone in that environment, so they would be included in that group. And, and as an employer, you may need to support those staff with a letter that says they are part of that workforce. Uh, for them to then be eligible to get it. So Trent Ethos have got a, a receptionist. Um, she may, let me just use a hypothetical, maybe 20 odd years of age, uh, otherwise fit and well. So not eligible in the, in the sense of her, her age or her disease profile, but because she works in that uh, elevated risk environment, you as chief executive could sign a letter and provide her with a letter uh, for the to be able to get that vaccine earlier in in the rollout. So we've got another question here too. Um, in that, um, so a podiatrist uh, visiting a residential aged care facility weekly requested vaccine from management and was refused. What what next? Say that again. Just read that to me again. So the, a podiatrist is visiting a residential aged care facility. Um, mm. They've contacted the, re, the facility and asked whether they could be included in the vaccination and they said that, well, refused. Um, what would they do next uh, with respect um, to the vaccination? With that individual, I'd encourage them to contact myself or one of my team and we'll, we'll work through that with them. Um, I have to say that may be as a result of the uncertainty in the residential aged care sector at the moment. Um, it's very clear that uh, the, um, the AstraZeneca, and, and I'll, I'll be clear again, so initially it was anticipated that staff would get the Pfizer vaccine, um, but a policy decision has been made by government to uh, move that uh, to the AstraZeneca vaccine for staff, and that includes GPs and allied health providers who regularly visit. Um, I spoke to a facility today who have also added their pastoral care staff to the, to the list. Uh, so it sounds to me a little bit like an individual um, site decision that's not supported by policy. So again, okay. if that person wants to reach out to me, um, I'm more than happy to, to have a chat to them about that. So while we're on the practices, another question. Um, as a practice owner, can I mandate vaccinations for staff? 
Ah, tricky one, really tricky one. Look, the law at the moment uh, uh, is quite grey on that. There are some circumstances in which uh, employers can mandate the um, um, that staff have the vaccine, uh, and th those are quite limited at the moment. And we'll see the law, uh, sorry, or the the policy and the law evolve over the next few months. At this point in time, the uh, policy is that it is voluntary. Uh, we, as I say, we may see that change in some circumstances. There are some industries where the risk is significant and those industry groups uh, are considering their approach to that. And let me give you an example of that. So what we know from uh, the experience over the last 12 or so months is that the um, meat processing sector, the airline sector and the uh, hotel quarantine staff are at highest risk. Um, there is an argument that can be put that they are um, therefore uh, should be mandated. Now that's an argument that the employer would have to consider and have a look at the um, you know, uh, Fair Work Australia legislation and how that applies to their particular industry. You know, the, the flu vaccination for the aged care sector is mandated in some jurisdictions, including New South Wales. Um, and we, we are, you know, we may see some changes over time uh, with regards to the, the mandatory vaccination um, but but at this point in time, it's being treated as a voluntary process. So whilst we're on the tricky ones, John, mm. um, the next one is, can you refuse care to a patient that hasn't been vaccinated? Well, again, it's a voluntary, that's a business decision for business operators. And, and I would suggest that business operators, uh, and particularly those of us in the health industry, uh, need to um, uh, work to advocate for the uptake of the vaccine um, and, and use our powers of persuasion. We're all um, uh, well-versed in, in this area and if not, we've got access to the information and webinars like this hopefully help with that. And we're in a position then to have the conversation with our patients, clients, friends, relatives or whatever, to be able to say to them, look, this is what the science says. Um, you know, there is all this stuff out there on uh, Twitter and Facebook and so on, but this is what the science says. You know, the vaccine is safe. It's been through an approvals process in many countries, including Australia. Um, and the, uh, the evidence to date is that the vaccine um, is uh, well tolerated by the vast majority of the population. And there are a few notable exceptions and they're well spelt out in the product information sheets. Um, and they're being built on as we see the experience overseas and in Australia. Um, you know, I, I do not subscribe to the uh, sensationalist stuff that we see in some of the popular media around X number of deaths occurred in a certain setting. We don't know all the facts there. We don't know for example, whether that particular facility in Norway was a hospice or whether it was a residential aged care facility or what the clinical condition of those individuals who were said to have succumbed as a result of the vaccine. We just don't have enough detail. So, you know, we've, we've got to go on what we know and what we can um, confidently uh, attest to. Right, yeah, one, I've got another one here. Um, I think this was when you were talking about the vaccination um, and whether you could get COVID. So even following the vaccination, um, contracting um, the virus. So does this mean that someone who has had the vaccine can still be a carrier of COVID and therefore spread the disease? Um, I'll take that on notice and we'll provide an answer to that in writing. I might just check in with David Durheim because the science is changing 
uh, frequently. But what I said in my slide presentation is that we know, and the science uh, indicates that someone who's had the vaccine will have much milder symptoms, if any at all, um, from uh, the virus if they've been vaccinated and had the full course. Thank you, John. Now, I think uh, you may have covered all the questions we've had so far, unless any pop through. Ah, yes, I've had okay. one more pop Fiona through. Line. Yep, I can uh, see that one. Yep, so I work in a sole practice looking after dis disabled clients in their own homes. Um, that's all I've got so far. Um, so I, so let me just build on that uh, in their own homes. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah. where are they going to come in the, the vaccine rollout? So uh, someone like Fiona who's providing care to a patient in their own home and they're not part of a group home facility. So. What we're working through at the moment is how those residents will, sorry, how those members of the community will get their vaccine. They will be eligible for the vaccine in 1B. So the resident or the member of the community will be eligible for the vaccine in 1B because they fall into the group, of, generally speaking, of young people with underlying medical condition, including those with a disability or an elder person, et cetera. So, so that, those uh, patients or those uh, members of the community will be eligible in 1B. There is a reasonable argument to be put that someone in the uh, providing care to those people should also be vaccinated as part of 1B. And given that Fiona is a solo practitioner, she can write a letter for herself to support that. And, and um, when she's going through the uh, process of booking, provide that as evidence and, and it, along with other documentary evidence such as her APRA registration or whatever other documents she might want to do to support her case. Okay, I'll pick this, uh, a few more questions have come through. So does a business need to register um, or will it come via Allied Health Associations or the Doctor Association? Uh, the, the advice as to where you fit into the uh, roadmap uh, will be um, communicated by the Commonwealth Government, by primary health network, by peak bodies such as you know, the physio associations, et cetera, uh, by local professional groups. So in the case of the, um, let me pick the pharmacy group here in the Hunter, we'll, we'll be working with the Newcastle and Hunter Valley Pharmacy association to let them know when pharmacists are eligible. Uh, we'll also use social media and, and our newsletters. So, you know, if I, if I can get you to do one thing from tonight, please sign up for our newsletter so that we can get this information out to you. We don't want you missing out. We don't want you being delayed in receiving your vaccine. If you register with for our newsletter, we'll provide that information through to you. Okay, um, will a healthcare worker who's under 18 be able to receive the vaccine? Look, that's a good question and my initial answer would be yes, uh, even although it's um, not yet uh, approved for people under the age of 18. So my yes would be, subject to TGA approval. So at the moment, um, the vaccine is not approved for people under the age of 18. Um, and the reason for that is that globally, there are uh, quite a small number who've been vaccinated in that age cohort. Uh, so the evidence, the science, again, going to the science, the science is not there to support that. But I would expect by the time we get to even the 2A rollout, we'll have enough evidence and, and we'll have a definitive answer. But intuitively, I would say if they are uh, uh, working with patients in a face-to-face, uh, -face, hands-on way, uh, then um, there, there's an argument to be put for them. And look, I think you know where we where we um, where we would 
be challenged around that is if someone's 17 and nine months, for example, you know, there, there's all of this stuff around the, mar it's always the margins that get us into trouble. And, um, and the other area where I think we're going to see some advice come on this is, will be related to students in particular, uh, who often uh, do work experience and some other, uh, uh, oh, sorry, some prac experience from universities, etc. So, I think this is a, my my intuition says yes, but my um, the uh, analytical part of me says we should wait for the advice from TGA um, and and from the sector. Okay. Um... There's another question, how do I sign up for the newsletter um, so I don't miss any of the rollout information? So embedded in this presentation, which is going to be up on um, the PHN website uh, as of tomorrow, um, is that right? Yes, um, so are a number of links. Um, and if you go into the PHN, H-N-E-C-C PHN website, which is at the bottom of those slides, .com.au, um, you'll be able to click through and sign up for the newsletter there as well. Um, yeah. Now, the other one, John, whilst we've got some time and, not, and mm. questions are still trickling through, can you just reinforce, um, someone lost their audio, but I think it's all, it's, it's very good just to reinforce just the rollout across yeah. the allied health practitioner group of the vaccine and where they fit. Okay, so for, uh, practitioners who provide services into residential aged care facilities, they will be vaccinated as part of 1A uh, and are considered uh, staff of those facilities if they, you know, are a regular or, 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 or um, uh, itinerant workers. Uh, is is the phrase that's been used. I don't like it because it sounds like someone who just wanders around, but you know what I mean. So if you if you fall into that category and you have as an association with a residential aged care facility, please let the um, management at that facility know that you're interested in being vaccinated when the, the rest of the staff are. And if there are problems with that, please contact our team and we'll do what we can to support you with that um, that issue. The second group would be those in 1B, uh, and those are clinical and high risk workers, including defence, emergency services, etc. So those working in those uh, sort of frontline areas uh, would be eligible under 1B, and then more widely, uh, people working in the um, in the sort of broader sector 2A. Can I just, you've just, uh, you've just reminded me that I need to probably say something. The, the way the, the, um, the way that the uh, infographic is, is constructed, it's, it's almost like we do 1B, then we go to uh, 2A, then we go to 2B. The, the, the reality of it is that these phases will be running concurrently and will run for quite a bit of time. Um, I, I think this is probably about the millionth time I've said today that the limiting factor in all of this is the supply of the vaccine. So as the supply of the vaccine increases, the opportunity for individuals to be vaccinated will increase as well, not just in terms of uh, being more vaccine available, but more locations in which we can deliver the vaccine to and have it um, distributed to the population. So the, the biggest single limiting factor for us at the moment is the vaccine. Now, we, we had provisional TGA approval last week for AstraZeneca. As I said, that's been produced at CSL in Melbourne. And once that um, uh, plant ramps up its production to 24-7, we will see quite large volumes of the vaccine being produced, quality checked, uh, and then distributed to the sector. The other thing I probably should say, so that you, you are at least aware of it, is that Australia has taken a position that we shouldn't only look after our own backyard. So we will also uh, be providing vaccine to our near neighbours in the Pacific who 
um, uh, want to uh, vaccinate and uh, uh, who want to uh, acquire the vaccine from, from, sorry, the AstraZeneca vaccine from Australia. So the Australian government, so when you, if you do the maths on the number of vaccines that we've signed up for, the number of doses, I think it's, um, it's 1.4 times the population of Australia. Now, part of that is to allow for wastage, but the other part of it is to allow us to meet some uh, regional um, support uh, obligations, which I think is admirable as a country that we can do that. And again, just go back to the point that Australia, because we listen to the science and our health professionals, is in a really, really good position. You know, we got almost uh, very few deaths, almost no impact on our healthcare system. We are able to do have you know a fairly um, normal life compared to our uh, friends in the UK and the US, who are you know endured quite significant periods of lockdown. Um, and I have to say, probably in miserable weather. Uh, so, you know, we, we're doing really well and Australians need to pat themselves on the back for that. Oh, yeah, well, we're not, um, haven't got another question through uh, yet. Um, and just to comment and build upon the newsletter information, I believe there's a, an email going out for all attendees just um, with links yeah. uh, and the, um, slide pack as well so yeah and look uh, I think Charles or someone has posted the link in the last question uh, mm -hmm. we'll get that out to uh, those of you who want it um, the the newsletter is only as good as uh, what you tell us you want in it right so if you've got feedback please provide us with feedback on the newsletter as well um, we we look to make it um, meaningful. It's it's not just a P. It is absolutely not a PA, PR exercise. It's an exercise in making sure that our providers and our community are informed. Um, one one last thing I might touch on that I was asked earlier by a rather inquisitive journalist, uh, Trent, is just on when will the public campaign start to make them aware. Um, <clears throat> so the the Commonwealth government have a uh, communications campaign and plan developed and that's been approved by the minister uh, and, and by the prime minister and cabinet once the vaccine is sorry once the astrazeneca vaccine is available for distribution that campaign will kick off um, we intend to try to build on that because um, you know the the national campaign will be a national campaign um, but what we'd like to do as a primary health network is try and localise that. So we'll be doing some a series of uh, um, short videos with uh, locals to help uh, communicate to our community and to other healthcare providers uh, about the vaccine. We're looking to use local identities, um, you know, sports people or people who are recognised and um, if you like, respected in our community uh, to to get their sort of um, uh, view on it and help us uh, communicate. And that's look, that's going to be particularly important for our Aboriginal communities and for the migrant communities across our, our um, footprint. We know and we completely understand that those uh, particular groups have a degree of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, particularly the migrant groups who are recently resettled. You know, the the um, history for those people is not great. And they, they are, um, if you like, sensitised to government um, campaigns. So we need to work with respected people in those communities to ensure that they get um, a clear uh, well-articulated messages in their own language and in their own cultural uh, context so that um, uh, um, that we can, you know, make sure that people get it. Um, they may still not choose not to have the vaccine, but it becomes a more informed choice than, if you like, a, a, a choice from lack of information, etc. 
We're also uh, working to ensure that the material that's provided is health literate, right? Because uh, we know uh, that not everyone uh, is able to read some of the technical information. And, and I have to be honest, uh, some of it is quite challenging to read. Um, so I think that part of our role as a primary health network is to uh, articulate that information in a way that everyone has access to. So not just social media, not just electronic campaigns, but other mediums, so radio, um, uh, newspaper print, or whatever it takes to get that message out, to make sure that our communities understand the value of having um, uh, the vaccine uh, and, and what it means for them. With the, particularly with the Aboriginal community, we're partnering with the local health districts uh, who also have significant Aboriginal health staff working for them. Um, I'm hoping, and I've yet to have the conversation with him, I'm having, I'd like to have a conversation with Dr. Kelvin Kong, who's a re very respected uh, practitioner in our region and see if he'll front a campaign for us. Um, but if not, we'll, we'll find someone else who, who is equal uh, equally able to articulate the message, but you know, be really keen if people have got ideas about how we can get that out uh, in a way that patients can understand it. Happy to make sure again that you have um, access to posters and leaflets and so on for your practices. Well, let's. Uh, and it's Eric push Hart. Oh. Can I? Thanks, sorry, Eric, can I yeah. just add a, one more? Um, so on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page at the moment, a video has just gone up um, for consumers um, by two Central Coast GPs, Dr. Karen Douglas and Dr. Catherine Palmquist, and they're they're having about a 20 minute chat about the vaccine, where things are at at the moment, and um, just general information um, in sort of very very clear language um, for patients and consumers. So allied health professionals are uh, welcome to share those um, on their social media um, websites and um, social media pages um, and just encourage patients to ask questions and, and get information from their trusted health professionals. Thanks. Thanks, Erica. Good good to be reminded of that. Can I also just say that for, for our colleagues listening in that we run a series of uh, webinars on a fairly regular basis. Now, Sometimes the titles would indicate that they're targeted at GPs or at uh, residential aged care facilities or whatever it may be. Please feel free to participate in those, even if you don't see that it initially fits your particular professional group. Um, I, as a registered nurse, get a lot out of the uh, presentations by David Durheim, Kat Taylor and um, and uh, John Ferguson from the local health districts there. We, we are so lucky in this part of the world that we've got really well uh, versed uh, and well respected individuals um, uh, um, who, who are you know, connected into uh, the, the global effort to, to work with this. So, Thanks, Warren. I, I didn't know that Nathan was back, but I'll I'll certainly follow up on uh, Nathan Blacklock and see if he'd, he'd be happy to have a chat for us. Let's hope the Bush Telegraph gets to them, and I'll be in contact with you, John. <laughs> that would be good. And look, if you do know individuals who are respected in your communities, um, you know, uh, please let us know because we, you know, people don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from other people that they recognise, faces and voices that they recognise. Um, you know, I'd like to talk to a couple of our commercial radio jocks and see if they'd voice some stuff for us. And because this is a really important public health uh, effort, and we've all got to get behind it. Thanks, Warren. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> Okay. Um, what are we? We've got ten minutes. If there's any last questions anyone um, has, uh, please send them through now. Um, but in their absence, I think we could almost um, bring it to a close. And I just want to jump in and again say thank you, John um, and Erica and Charles too, for pulling this together. It's um, 
again been a very informative um, information session. So thank you. Thanks, Trent, and thanks for your participation. Very much appreciated. No, you're yeah, busy. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Trent. Yeah, really appreciate it. Um, I can see as well there hasn't been any further questions, so we might wrap it up there. Um, we really appreciate your time, John and Trent. Um, that was a great discussion. Thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. Uh, just a reminder that there will be an evaluation survey that will pop up when the webinar ends. If you could just take a moment to fill that one out. Uh, before you log off tonight, we really appreciate it. Uh, I will be sending out the uh, vaccine resources that John mentioned, as well as the slides straight after this webinar. Um, but also head to our website, thephn.com.au, where we have further information and previous recordings for our uh, COVID vaccine updates. All right, thanks again, everyone, and we hope you have a great evening. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for your Thank all you your guys. support. Cheers. Thanks. See you later.